Hey guys, my name is Jade. I'm going to be a future social studies teacher, and I'm super excited to get into talking today with Simon about, you know, what digital literacy is and what it means for us as educators and non-educators. Hey guys, my name's Simon, and uh, today I'm going to talk with Jade about digital literacy and 21st century skills, specifically what is literacy. Um, I myself am kind of on the other end of the spectrum, so to say. I'm not an educator. I'm, uh, I'm actually a network administrator, though, for a school district. So my job essentially is to support teachers in their journey of integrating technology into the classroom. So I think this should be a pretty interesting discussion. Do we need to define literacy? I don't think so. Uh, when I asked Professor Hung, he kind of described it as a starting point um, for our conversation and then to move forward from that. Um, that. And I don't think that there's a clear cut definition of literacy either. I think that because of the class that we're in and because of the, I guess, nature of um you know, digital literacy, you can't really define it as a single thing. But if you want to take a shot at, you know, defining it, by all means. I mean, I think in the context of all of this, it really doesn't make any sense. You know, I always thought literacy is the ability, uh, I mean, the ability to read and write, right? But right. in this day and age, is the ability to read and write isn't enough. No, you not know? even a little bit. Yeah, so... You know, literacy, I think, is a good synonym at this point for knowing. Yeah. You know? Uh, In the most simple form, too. Yes. Not even, you know, any kind of complex definition of it, but just the, I wouldn't say the bare minimum, but, mm -hmm. right. you know, just the, the foundational stuff. Right. So you picked out four quotes um, from the reading that I kind of put like little notes to myself underneath. So the first one you picked out, if you want to read it. Sure. So the first quote that I picked out was from um, the Ito reading, which was the connected learning reading um, that read connected learning is learning that connects personal interests, supportive relationships and academic, civic and career opportunity. So I guess as I was reading through this and I was trying to, I guess, grasp the meaning behind connected learning it i think really it put education in context hmm. right in in this day and age where you know times are obviously changing but we're also making education a lot more individualized because it's changing so because of that in combination with this increased reliance on technology we're able to more readily I guess, connect our students with their personal interests and their outside relationships, all in this way that kind of contributes meaning to their lives outside of school. Right. I definitely noticed that. Um, so so I have a, a six year old and a three year old son, three year old, not so much yet. He's just starting, you know, our, he's, he's got a good grasp on language, but you know, and, and stuff like that. But he's he's just Mr. Playtime all the time and he's in preschool, so it doesn't really count yet. But my son Pierce is in uh, first grade and he, you know, I noticed a lot that he takes anything he learned in school that maybe piques his interest, even in the slightest, or even stuff he watches on TV or even something that he heard in a, a passing conversation or even like songs on the radio. And if he finds enough interest in it, he will take that concept or that word or, or that thing or whatever, whatever it is, and he will integrate it into his play. And it's an interesting way after doing the reading for me, I was like, wow, he's just reinforcing it for himself. He's actually active learning. Um, yeah. So that like is really interesting to me that that isn't just some philosophy that teachers learn or educators learn to to reinforce learning. It's like a natural thing. That's something that right. happens naturally, um, in, especially in little kids. And um, and that, you know, playing off of that should be, you know, an important thing that people are, are, are aware of. And that 
you know, not a lot of people see it, you know, with little kids. Um, but I definitely do because I have one in my house all the time. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to throw that out there in, in, in regards to this. No, I think that, that was definitely relevant. I mean, I think that goes for anybody, really. If if you're learning about something and, and it piques your interest, doing things as simple as, you know, if a kid likes baseball, working that into a math problem, all of a sudden they become invested. You know, uh, mm -hmm. it, it means something to them when they're right. doing the problems and thinking about the ramifications in their real life. And I think that, you know, the tendency for us to do that naturally, it comes from a very real place. We want to make sense of the world around us with the things that we like, with right. the things that we're interested in and then the things that we're passionate about. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if educators aren't doing that, it's going to be that much harder for them mm -hmm. to get through to their students. Yeah. And it sounds like, you know, for you as an educator, you know, for me as not as a non-educator looking at you as an educator, I'm like, wow, that is an insurmountable task. Take every single one of your students' interests and meld it into your lesson plan. It's like not possible at all. But, you know, I think that since we're on the subject of literacy and technology, that could be something a little bit more tangible for teachers with technology, with the help of technology saying, you know, with a little bit of self-discovery, you know, meld it into what your, your interests are. And with the help of the internet, we can connect the two dots. Right. So. Absolutely. I could not agree more. I mean, even just, I guess that sparks a thought for me is just, you know, to what extent can teachers actually do that for their students? You know, you can't, you can't personalize everything to everyone, mm -hmm. right? But you can try and you can get kind of close and you can, you know, do little things here and there, but I don't think that there's a, a single clear cut way to make educational experiences I guess, as meaningful for one student as it is for, you know, all of your students mm. or, you know, vice versa. Right. Well, let's move on to the next quote. And I will read this one from Ito. Uh, new digital tools support new forms of literacy and self-expression and online affinity networks enable young people to connect to a wider range of specialized communities of interest. The first thing that popped out in my mind into my mind when I uh, read this quote was social media groups, things like Reddit and Facebook groups where a like my, I mean, in today's day and age, this could, it's also not totally a good thing. Right. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, <laughs> forgetting, putting that aside for a second, um, you know, things like Reddit groups or Facebook groups or any other kind of community online community of, of folks who have the same interests um, you know is definitely something that is a affinity network so one of the things that I do in my school district as a network administrator is I do monitor or help the administrators monitor students activity online with uh, their Chromebooks mm -hmm. um, so it is interesting to see that activity. It's not always, it sounds like a horrible nightmare of a situation, but it's really not. <laughs> it's really not like for the most part, you know, we're it's, it's, it's more interesting than like, oh my God, this is terrifying. Um, but it's, it's um, to see like what groups they gravitate towards. It's interesting to see almost the groups. I mean, not for all students, some students aren't engaged whatsoever, but a good amount of students can gravitate certain towards certain online communities dependent on what classes they're taking. If you have a different perspective, definitely please. I mean, I don't know that I have a different perspective as much as I have just, um, I guess, experience with that, uh, the quote itself. Um, you know, I guess growing up in this age of technology, the way that I have, I mean, I'm only, um, you know, a first year graduate student. So I'm, you know, born in 98, everything in my life has just rapidly grown in terms of technology. I, you know, 
grew up in the age of cell phones and tablets and I got to watch kids, you know, like, Mm. I guess become increasingly reliant on that stuff. But as somebody who grew up with it and sees the harms, I also see the benefits of it. Um, And I mean, when you talk about enabling young people to connect to a wider range of specialized communities of interest, I, I thought instantly of just this past week, you know, all of a sudden, you know, people my age are, you know, doing things with their money that they never thought that they could do because of this information that, you know, is available to them on Reddit, you know, they're, they, you know, didn't realize that these, I guess, um, I mean, I don't fully understand it well enough to explain it, but in these communities of people who do understand and they take the time out of their day to learn about it. And they said, well, wait, if they're able to, you know, manipulate the market in this way, well, why can't I get my piece? Mm -hmm. And a lot of them did. And a lot of them are doing really well because of it. And that's not to say that there's, you know, no downfalls or anything, but you know, they, they have the resources and the access to do that and to do it so quickly. You know, these, these groups of people mobilized in, you know, a day, they basically shut down the entire market for a minute. It was kind of crazy. Um, yeah. I think just that having access to those digital tools gives us the opportunities for new kinds of literacy. People I know who had never learned about stocks, who had never done any kind of investing of their own are all right. of a sudden very interested and very invested in, yeah. you know, what's going on in economics, right? right? More, more generally, aside from, you know, wanting to make money and things like that, they have this newfound interest in this thing that's going on in the world more generally. Mm-hmm. So I think it just lends itself really well to the fact that we'll seek out the things that interest us Mm. right and we'll learn from those things and we'll be able to grow from them so i thought that that was um just one of those things that it was timely you know yeah it fit right in (laughs) i have two comments in response to this one i got a cell phone in 1998 my first cell phone (laughs) and two i think that these groups you know of, of people on the internet kind of binding together within days to make this sweeping you know, movement in anything. I mean, whether it's the the Wall Street bros, that thing that's happening right now on Reddit, or mm-hmm. it was Black Lives Matter, right? Right. Like those things, I want to say the technology allowed literacy to happen faster. Yes. That's what yeah. I think is the point here with that. It's that yeah. a group of people, almost, I guess, the thing, the term that comes to my mind is hive mind. Again, yeah. you can take that as good or bad, but um, that kind of just naturally occurred on the internet with these big, large groups of people, and it caused movements. It caused the the, the physical world to shift, and it again, and all of the people involved, it, it enabled people. Every every single one of those people collectively learned something from each other within like hours, right? Which is pretty crazy if you think about it that way that's insane yeah the entire thing is insane yeah because i I remember just i think you know what really set it in for me just how quickly all of this stuff moves and it it overwhelms me actually when it happened but on an inauguration day when that picture of bernie sanders was circulating around the internet and i think three hours had gone by since the picture was initially posted and i had seen dozens like dozens of memes of bernie sanders in different settings in different places in you know videos even and it just it moves so fast and while this could be a good thing and it was a good thing for you know a lot of different causes it can also be a very dangerous thing you know Mm -hmm. it leads to that whole you know echo chamber effect for lack of a better word of you know lots of people just kind of listening to their own voices and their own opinions just being repeated back to them but if used correctly i think it has a lot of potential to do a lot of good too you know unfortunately humanity (laughs) this is a much bigger discussion for a much longer podcast but like you know humanity needs to learn how to take things in moderation and to step back and use 
you know, not just take things at face value. Um, Absolutely. And, you know, these things are great and we have all these abilities to communicate with everybody in the world all at once. And, but, you know, at the same time, you need to realize, whoa, 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 the human mind is not built for this. Right. You know, so we're, we are built for face to face communication. So, mm -hmm. so I think as, you know, that's the challenge of society is recognizing a, yeah, my statement saying that these things made literacy happen faster. And that sounds really awesome, but maybe it's not that awesome. Maybe, yeah. you know, you need to realize like, okay, it makes literacy happen faster for some people, but maybe not everyone, you know? Right. So, for other people, it might be moving a little too fast. Even. Exactly. Which actually brings us really well into our next quote from the reading. So the next quote was on page 12. Um, critical research has often been relegated to the sidelines of social change and technology development efforts because of its focus on critique and lack of a positive vision for design and action. Conversely, technology-fueled efforts at educational reform have often suffered from an overly optimistic view of the power of technology and innovation to drive positive social change, which is loaded, yeah. but certainly relevant. Uh, do you want to get started with that? Yeah, sure. My view as a technologist, right? Somebody who whose job it is to enable teachers to use technology every day, whether, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, you know, I've, I've spent the last year at my job helping teachers do hybrid learning, you know, with remote, with COVID, you know, kids mm -hmm. being, re certain kids being remote. My district's lucky enough that we actually have <laughs> low enrollment, but big enough buildings so that we act we're full full time back now um and wow. have been have been most of the year i we still have kids who do have to, for, for health reasons have um have to be remote learning mm -hmm. um so my big thing as that type of person in my district has been this is not the answer to any of your problems this computer this webcam google classroom none of it none of it is the problem the answer to any of your issues with teaching kids remotely um, but it's a tool that you can, you, you know, it's there to enhance the experience for them. Right. We could just get everybody on a conference call during a class and that would be completely useless. I could put a phone in the middle of the room and the teacher could just talk to the student. Maybe they have a handout you mailed to them or the was dropped off with the bus, you know, a packet was dropped mm -hmm. off at the bus stop, you know, or whatever. And it would be useless. But with this stuff, you can add visuals in. And that's incredibly valuable. You can add visuals in. They can not only hear your voice, they can see you. At the end of the day, I always tell everybody, this is a tool. This is not the answer. This is not the end all be all. Keep being a teacher the way exact way you would be a teacher if there was a chalkboard in front of you. And that's mm -hmm. it. You just need to learn. You just need to figure out how to take that chalkboard concept and put it into this context. If you're talking about it just solely, even just from a, a social standpoint, a lot of people are, are not doing too well no. because of all of the technology that we're being forced to use. But I guess just as a, not so much a sideline, but um, in an effort to, you know, weasel our way into including our outside source, I want to um, kind of just allude to this video that I, I watched Mm -hmm. Um, it was a Ken Robinson, uh, Ted talk where he gets into education paradigms and how things are shifting and how we're no longer in this industrial society, you know, where we need bell schedules and we need, mm -hmm. you know, grades organized by age as, as opposed to skill level or things like that. But building on your idea of there's no replacement for social interaction, we think about how much the arts have suffered mm -hmm. or COVID, oh, you yeah. know, um, movement away from the arts. Children are, you know, taken out of their, you know, studio art classes and their music classes and their dance and theater and things like that, all in, in favor of the academic subjects, you know, math and reading and writing and all of these other things. And I think that the move towards more technology is moving even further away from the arts. Mm -hmm. You know, Absolutely. it's, and I mean, for me as, as a kid who grew up in that stuff, 
was important to me. It gave me an outlet. It gave me an opportunity to express myself and all of these other things. I think it can be, it can be risky creating even more distance between kids and opportunities to express themselves, which I just thought would be an interesting kind of thought to consider in relation to all of this. It wasn't something that I had thought of, you know, as I was reading the articles, but it it was something that came up as I was thinking about it more. You right. know, as a future social studies teacher, I really don't think about the arts that much either because I'm worried about, you know, making sure that my content is getting across and making sure that, you know, I'm meeting standards and things like that. But, you know, the kids aren't going to do well if they don't have outlets, Mm -hmm. if they don't have opportunities to be creative. You know, we talk about all of these 21st century skills and the four C's that are, you know, referred to all throughout the Soleil and Warwick reading. The four C's that they bring up throughout that entire um, article are based in, you know, like life skills, Yeah. you know, the ability to communicate with people and the ability to have creative capacity and, you know, work in teams and to innovate and all of these other things. You're not going to cultivate any of that mm-hmm. by, you know, kind of just drilling the academic stuff. Right. You have to get into the other stuff too. Let's wrap it up with the last quote. Sure. Um, let's see. Our last quote says that preparing children for creative and high-tech jobs does not guarantee that those jobs will materialize just because workers are standing by. Based on his surveys of employers in manufacturing, Andrew Weaver has argued against blaming workers in schools. He argues that instead of fretting about a skills gap, we should be focused on the real challenge of knitting together the supply and demand sides of the labor market. I mean, I, I tend to agree with that. The other thing is that, if anything, this last year has really just thrown me for a loop, right? I think it gave us a lot of unprecedented challenges and all of these new things are coming up that didn't matter a year ago. Um, You know, just take the, you know, online school, I guess, platform, right? Switching from a, you know, completely in-person social setting to a remote setting. I think that the fact that the world was able to change that quickly lends itself really well to the fact that it's going to keep changing. And what we do now is going to have a massive impact on the kinds of people that we'll have ready to work 20 years from now, 30 years from now. And I think that seeing that this change in Uh, I guess transformation is moving more towards automation and focusing on, you know, I guess getting people to have real people skills should be more of a concern than it is. I think that we're moving a lot faster with the anticipation that we're going to have this high tech future, but people, like you said earlier, people aren't wired that way. We're not wired to do everything remotely a lot of people are are suffering right now because they're home and they're doing everything online and you know they're not having social interactions with their friends or their co-workers and all of that is really hurting our capacity to to be around other people yeah i've noticed that even just over the course of the last year you know i had probably more mild social anxiety prior to covid Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, I I get very overwhelmed when I'm around a lot of people for extended periods of time. Yeah, absolutely. It's hurting my ability to be social, to be empathetic Mm -hmm. in some ways. Like there's this distance that's created between ourselves and others, obviously physically, but also like emotionally and in our abilities to uh, communicate with each other and interact in meaningful ways. And I think that you know, moving closer and closer to this highly digitized world can be dangerous for us. Um, Or maybe not dangerous, but risky. You know, a lot of people aren't realizing that there are very real ramifications of this very high tech planet that we're all envisioning in the next 50 years. Mm -hmm. But I think that if we're focusing on making sure that people have these people skills that they are talking about in the article, you know, making sure that we're able to work collaboratively with others and making sure that we're able to 
you know, be creative, but also accept criticism. All of that comes from a place of working with other people, yep. which is that much harder when you're not talking to other people. Right. So, um, you know, that's kind of where I was going with that whole thought process. But, I, you know, I, guess I completely I agree. It's like the great irony, right? That yeah. we have all these amazing tools, but none of them are giving us the skills that we need to be successful in the 21st century because right. they're lacking that social an emotional aspect to them. I guess we should end with the question, right? Which is, what is literacy? It's such a broad thing. You know, you can't, you can't answer this in a 15 minute podcast. There's, there's no replacement Mm. for social interaction. I think in the 21st century, if the most literate people are going to be those people who are well versed in social interaction. Absolutely. You I need to have that's feelings, it. you know, yeah. you need to be able to, to, I guess, translate and make sense of the things that people are saying to you online and in a way that I guess is meaningful. Mm-hmm. You have to make meaning from all of these things that are, you know, when I type my comments in Google doc, you have no idea what my tone of voice is. You have no idea what my thought processes are. I could have written this entire Google doc, you know, high out of my mind. Like I could have done (laughs) it that way and nobody would know because how would, how would anybody know? No. And there's, because there's no replacement for that social interaction that you have with people. There's no way of cultivating well-rounded people just online. All right, guys. So this is Jade and Simon signing off.